it's a great honor to welcome you to this uh, joint inaugural conference between UVRI and our unit, the MRC UVRI and LSHTM uh, Uganda Research Unit. To Her Excellency the British High Commissioner, we deeply appreciate the UK's continued support to the unit, as well as for global health research in general, and the long-standing a relationship between the UK government and the Ugandan government is very strong and in a way that's what brought about the existence of our unit. Uganda is one of the great success stories in the fight against HIV AIDS. Since the 1980s, the unit has provided expert advice to the government of Uganda on HIV prevention and treatment and engaged in direct patient care and human resource capacity building. Many doctors globally will refer to the unit as the dream workplace or provide a fond memory or interaction with the scientists from the units during trainings or research collaborations. We are proud of our financial investment and what more than four decades of partnership has been able to achieve for Uganda's public health sector and for wider Africa. As a government, we recognize that science and technology are fundamental to our ability to prevent, detect, and respond to both emerging and persistent health challenges. That is why we remain committed partnerships that enhance our research capacity and promote knowledge, exchange and build resilient health systems. As we explore these vital issues, let us reaffirm our commitment to translating research into action and ensuring that scientific discoveries benefit all. It is now my honor and pleasure to declare this conference officially open. Thank you very much. At UNAIDS, we've started the process of um, consulting widely for the next Global AIDS Strategy, which kicks off next year. The vision is that this will be a Global AIDS Strategy that's driven by innovation, that of course is driven by inclusivity and uh, eliminating inequalities like the current strategy has been. In 2030, there is some modeling that has shown there will still be an estimated 30 to 40 million people living with HIV they will require care and treatment to remain healthy and uh, virally suppressed while keeping incident infections under control. So even given the 2030 goal, there is 2030 and beyond. That is the future of the HIV response. So I, I wonder whether this is maybe a time to rethink what we do with a HIV response, how we run it to rethink the way we deliver services, to reinvent our partnerships, to reimagine the investment in the HIV response. What would the future look like if the global community gave everything they have to the search for that elusive effective vaccine or a functional HIV cure? I do not have any of these answers, but I'm just putting these questions on the table because I think this is the time to reflect and imagine differently if we dare. Thank you very much. So some of the things that we have pushed, the agenda we have pushed as Africa CDC is to move um, the platform for vaccine manufacturing and upgraded it to a platform for harmonized Africa health products manufacturing. So beyond vaccines, we're looking at other therapeutics, we're looking at um, diagnostics and so on and so forth. What is our call to action? 
Ladies and gentlemen, Africa needs to lead the agenda on local manufacturing and not to be led, always be led by other partners. We need to learn from those who started before us and are good at it, but we also need to lead the decisions on our continent. We remain committed to supporting the countries and achieving vaccine reliance. Thank you very much. Asante sana. I think there are some French people. Merci beaucoup. Shukran. Obrigado. And now I have to say this correctly. Oui, balé, Thank you. Asthma is the most common non-communicable disease in childhood, although it affects adults as well. It affects 262 million people globally and causes 450 deaths annually. The prevalence is on the increase in Africa and other low and middle income countries. And in those same areas, there is asthma is grossly underdiagnosed and undertreated. So what causes asthma? We do not have a single cause, direct cause for asthma known but several risk factors have been identified, and these seem to be established early in life, although clinical symptoms may appear later in childhood or even adulthood. So the call to action is really for further research to understand the causes and mechanisms of, of asthma, particularly non-allergic asthma, because it's, it's the least understood type of asthma, so that we can develop better treatments. If we look at chronic conditions and view that through a dementia lens, this issue of a life course, and as the chair of the National Health Research Committee said right at the start of today, he spoke about all of society, meaning across sectors and certainly across disciplines uh, in relation to the life course. There's continuity. What happens in the young stages influences the middle stages and the later stages, and of course aging is hardly only about older people. These health and social transitions are occurring rapidly and they can be complex and they're going to be exacerbated by the funding pressures that have been alluded to. But they must support innovation. They have to support innovation in prevention and care and many before me today have emphasized that. The critical risks for later chronic disease including dementias are diabetes, blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, HIV. The more we engage each other and support and learn and work and win with each other, the better off we are. Thank you. So today we are going to be having a panel discussion uh, on climate change and health. I feel that it is a matter that we really don't talk enough about unless something has happened. Previously, I used to think about infant feeding, um, population diets, but over the last seven years, I've been thinking about how the way we produce food and the kinds of foods that we choose to um, consume contributes to climate change and also the health of uh, populations. If at all we're going to address the issues to do with climate change holistically, it's about bringing the conversations of mental health and having mental health experts in those conversations where climate adaptation and um, environmental resilience conversations are happening. We can no longer work in silos. It involves bringing those specific people on those tables so that they appreciate as much as they're trying to reduce the biomedical um, effects of one degree. There's all these other social impacts that we have to address at the same time. Community engagement that is either not done or done poorly can result in a lot of unwanted consequences these include misinformation, it includes uh, harm to people, to pro participants, and even unplanned stoppages of well-designed and well-meaning uh, research. And we do have examples of this. Uh, and that's why we consider community engagement to be both a science and an art. So more than ever, we need community engagement to help us to co-design a way forward so that we are responding to the health challenges that we have. At Mino Health AI Labs, we essentially focus on AI for health. 
Over the years, we've applied AI to different areas within healthcare and biology. But quite recently, we developed a new set of AI tools. So these are generative AI tools. We have two main ones. So this is Moremi AI and Moremi Bio. So with Moremi AI, essentially what we have is a single AI tool that can do everything from screening, diagnosis, treatment planning to uh, prediction, prescription, diagnosis. And it does this for somewhere close to about, let's say, 100, 200 diseases. So we get to see the benefits of AI in the real world. You get to also do this on a commercial level, but also prioritize uh, safety too as well. Yeah. This has been the first science conference organized by the MRC, uh, UVRI and London School Unit, together with the Uganda Virus Research Institute. Overall, I think it has been a good conference. Uh, it has been uh, a, an opportunity to interact, uh, to work together, uh, strengthen our partnerships, uh, but also to show our young scientists where science is going and also to uh, ensure that they are part of our work and they are the future of our organization. In, in general, it's been a very successful event. We are very proud with what has been achieved and the feedbacks that we've had. We've had a number of discussions with topics ranging from HIV, Ebola, basic science, as well as social sciences, and also discussing topical issues around climate change and artificial intelligence, how it might be applied in the context of health. I've really uh, learned a lot, beginning from uh, understanding even just the institution, uh, MRC as an institution, and what they have been doing in terms of vaccine research, in terms of uh, even a uh, virus research, the importance of uh, uh, working with colleagues, be it across the life sciences, social sciences, and even engaging also with stakeholders within the policy space and also even, even within the communities. It's basically a research dissemination conference. So everyone is presenting what they've been up to, their achievements, their challenges. And yes, it's an interesting thing to see what really so many scientists are out there doing and we are learning from them a lot, especially as an early career research scientist. It makes a lot of sense. My take home message is that uh, it is important to share experiences. It is important to build new partnerships. And it's crucial that the work that we do, the research that we do, does not end up in, on our shelves, but actually is shared, disseminated, and hopefully most of it translated into policy and practice so that in the end, it actually results in change, in improvements in people's lives.